Hi. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for the moment, I'm assuming that uh, everybody's um, on the same timeline as me um, in the UK. Um, but for others, Niha. Um, title of this uh, presentation is China, the Unexpected Political Economy. And whatever any of us might think about China and its uh, political economy, um, certainly many things in the last 30 or 40 years have, have been unexpected. I'm not going to talk uh, at least directly about uh, categories or models about or particular uh, slogans even that we might understand uh, China through, um, except to say, um, I suppose I'm putting my stall out here, is that um, the Chinese leadership uh, talks about itself in terms of uh, its regime, its, um, its model as being socialism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, I would rather pose this as being capitalism uh, with Chinese characteristics. Um, one major failing, I think, of Western commentators uh, in looking at China, which I think they are now beginning to um, regret or feel disabused by, and I'm talking particularly uh, about um, anything from the American administrations of the last 20 or 30 years uh, to um, more uh, liberal and left uh, commentators uh, in the European tradition, is that the assumption that China's economic future and economic prosperity would inevitably uh, translate into uh, a political liberalism or a more open society, um, a democratic society, or even um, a post-democratic society, uh, at least for the moment, um, have proved uh, unfounded. Um, on this, um, in the period where this was propounded more aggressively, um, perhaps 10 years ago, was that it was always historically illiterate. The assumption that there would be an inevitable progress between economic progress, capitalist economic progress, and political liberalism um, is um, certainly not historically verifiable or verified. Um, I give you the most pertinent example being uh, the Meiji Restoration in Japan in 1868, which uh, um, um, produced a huge degree, uh, although quite limited compared with America, of capitalist development, but uh, uh, a failure uh, of democratic institutions. So that's the broadest category that I am um, I understand myself and um, which I think is intrinsically useful. What I am going to do is I'm going to begin, and Kevin indicated this in little ways, by giving five or six um, uh, snapshots of my own experience uh, of working in this China uh, over the last uh, almost 20 years to relate that to a broader periodization of Chinese uh, history and development uh, since the middle of the 19th century, indicating within that certain themes which may be useful to explore more or I think uh, elucidate uh, contemporary China and then to pose both of those uh, two sections in a broader section, which um, I've called China, the USA, and the quest for global hegemony, to look at the, um, the potential uh, struggle uh, for leadership uh, between those two countries uh, and what that might mean uh, and what limits there may be uh, within that. So sort of to begin, um, at Oxford University, um, when I first went there um, as a teacher, as opposed to uh, a student in the, uh, I think in 2001, uh, I was Director of Social and Political Science in Continuing Education. I was responsible for adult learners and, re and returners, and it was a very rewarding and, and fruitful experience. Uh, but within a year, almost by accident, I was approached and asked to design a course for senior public officials from Guangdong province. Uh, Guangdong uh, at that time, um, one of the more developed, most developed uh, provinces in China, um, had experienced uh, an opening up from 1978 under Deng Xiaoping uh, much earlier uh, than many other areas of China. 
And the reason for this was that the then vice chancellor of, uh, of the university, uh, an economist called Colin Lucas, had been a special advisor to the governor of Guangdong. And the, um, the governor had asked for some training. Uh, they use the word training uh, rather than education um, for his senior officials. Um, uh, Colin Lucas first approached the uh, politics department who uh, ran away from it saying or screaming uh, uh, our uh, research exercise, research exercise, i.e. this would not contribute to their publications. And so it was uh, perhaps dumped with continuing education. Uh, I put together a program um, pretty much off the cuff, but within two years we had um, developed relationships with Guangdong and Guangzhou and Liaoning and Qingdao uh, as the core of our, of our work and I, I took it over. It's quite interesting to look at who these people were and, and what they were interested in, uh, because at first this was effectively um, time off for good behaviour. Um, you know, they'd reached a certain point in their careers, uh, they were allowed a foreign trip, um, they were quite old insofar as they spoke uh, any foreign language, uh, they spoke Russian uh, rather than English, and they were essentially interested in very narrow areas uh, of, um, of administration. Um, they were particularly interested in uh, the retirement policy for British civil servants. Uh, and I remember particularly uh, being struck by um, them asking to go to a farm in Oxfordshire uh, because of their assumption of the importance uh, of the agricultural uh, question, the, the land question, which of course they asked, um, how did we solve the land question in the UK? Um, and I rather flippantly referring back to the Swing Rebellion said that we sent uh, the peasantry to Australia, um, which of course I'm, I regret a little bit, but um, it did strike me that this was uh, something which hadn't been a major issue in Britain, but still remained a, a significant question in China. And unfortunately, I won't have much time to talk about it. But in the process of going to the farm, I was also struck by the fact that um, they got on the back of a, a tractor um, full of, um, uh, of newly um, cut hay uh, and straw and started sings, song, singing songs which they had, uh, they and perhaps their parents also had sung at the harvest during the Cultural Revolution when they'd been sent back to the land. So here we have a generation which harks back to a very different time in China's experience. But by the time I'd finished, uh, or by the time those programs slowed down, because uh, just before the anti-corruption campaign came in about seven or eight years ago, uh, China ceased to send significant numbers of its senior officials abroad, uh, partly, I think, uh, because they'd learned what they wanted to learn. Uh, and that was essentially a part of a shift from an embrace of American uh, neoliberal policies back towards what they considered their version of European social democracy, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Uh, but as al also, it was the sense that they had to present a good um, view of themselves in public because a number of the uh, programs, I hope to say not the programs that I directed, had been literally holidays and uh, one very striking example was a group of um, uh, Chinese civil servants ostensibly sent to a university in California who spent a week in Las Vegas. So there was a shift there in terms of uh, what they wanted. Uh, by the end, the people were much younger. Uh, certainly five or six, maybe eight years ago, they were much more open. Uh, they had much more knowledge of societies outside China and when they spoke a foreign language, it was more likely to be English than Russian. So you have a, a shift in the personnel uh, of uh, medium to high level uh, uh, public officials. My next example, which I think um, goes forward a little bit, and it's more or less at the same time, is that um, a Labour peer, uh, a political historian, um, uh, came and did a speech on governmental reform in Britain, including devolution uh, and six similar things. It was a competent and, and well-organized uh, uh, presentation, but he was taken aback, and to a point so was I, uh, 
uh, by the first question, which was, uh, why does the West use the issue of human rights in order to intervene in the internal affairs of other countries? And it's a striking example, I think, of the way that uh, Chinese uh, policymakers, uh, the Chinese uh, political elite, look at the construction of the world. Um, of course, um, I don't know who's out there, but depending on your point of view, um, the growth of liberal imperialism and intervention um, in the period from the 90s onwards uh, is a, a real marker uh, of Western uh, political uh, strategy, if you can call it a strategy. And uh, the response of China uh, was in fact, and I think this is rather bizarre, uh, was a defense of the Westphalian principle of 1648 of the sovereignty of nation states. And of course, this, is, this was particularly directed at their worry about any form of intervention or support for um, Tibet, uh, Taiwan, um, Hong Kong, or more recently, Xinjiang. And so you can see that there, is, there was a, a sense of a different approach uh, to international politics and a disjuncture uh, within that. Not many years later, um, after running um, probably the highest profile program that we ever did, um, Advanced Leadership Development Program, which was uh, funded by the UNDP, uh, but orchestrated and organized by the organization department of the Chinese Communist Party, um, responsible for uh, um, selection, promotion, and discipline. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to see their, uh, how, they, how they discipline, but uh, you probably understand that as well as, as I do, that we, we had people right up to ministerial level. And um, I went to Beijing perhaps three months after the, the program ran, um, and I was uh, taken uh, to dinner way, way outside uh, Beijing uh, by um, someone who was um, num um, uh, a minister in the Environmental uh, Protection uh, Agency. And he talked and talked and talked. And then after a, a very long period of time, he asked me if I, I had any questions. And I said, um, what do you regard uh, as the, the greatest uh, threat? Uh, to China. And he didn't quite answer it, but his point was something like this. He said, well, there are three issues I would like to draw your attention to. First is uh, Chinese business. And he said, we will do everything to accommodate uh, the needs and prosperity of new businesses in China. The second issue, back to the land question, was the peasantry. And we will do everything we can to ameliorate uh, the position of the peasantry, but we will not tolerate any dissension. And the third issue, and I think he's, I think my memory is a little bit uncertain on this, he specifically mentioned Taiwan. He said, we will be absolutely opposed and uh, we will be determined to stop any form of foreign intervention. Going forward again, um, and remember, try and well, hold this in your in your in your mind or in your heads in relationship to the recent chronology uh, and the more global impact uh, of changes in the world from a global financial crisis onwards. I'd like to talk or briefly mention the Beijing Olympics in 2008 and the Shanghai Expo in 2012, and more specifically the second one. I have no direct experience with the Beijing Olympics. Um, I never watched the opening ceremonies, so I, I was not neither impressed or bored uh, by that. But clearly both of them had the purpose of announcing China to the world as being in a new situation. I spent a month and a half in Shanghai around the time of the Sh of Shanghai Expo 2012, and I asked uh, and conducted a number of um, focus groups and interviewed people from volunteers right through to policymakers and asked them what they thought about it and why um, Shanghai Expo was so important. The first answer I got was that it was um, for training cadre. Uh, and they showed me all the plans. There was a huge book about this thick, about how to organize uh, the Expo. Uh, and I said, well, yeah, that's okay. But 
this could be done in many different contexts. Uh, the second one they said was, well, it's to develop our infrastructure. Um, and certainly that happened. It was a period of the massive expansion of, of the Shanghai Metro, which by the way is pretty wonderful. Um, but again, I said, well, look, you don't need to have an expo for that. Uh, and the third reason which they came out with was of course that it was to illustrate that China was now a significant part uh, of the modern world, of the contemporary world. And I think that's, that was the real sense of China emerging, um, which it hadn't been uh, in an earlier period, because when I'd had that dinner in Beijing, the point that um, the minister made to me was that we're not very confident. We're not very confident that these things will continue to be good. Um, we think that we could easily go back to the terrible days of the uh, interwar period. Um, uh, and we could, I don't think he mentioned, he wouldn't mention uh, the, the Great Leap Forward and the famine and the Cultural Revolution, but the sense that uh, China was not a stable, was not necessarily going to progress, was the dominant one. But by 2012, uh, this had certainly uh, begun to change. Uh, and um, as I'll go on to, to show, there was a, a shift uh, of emphasis, there was a shift of attitude um, that China was a, about to play a very different role in the world. I'm going to check on my timing here, which is um, going badly. Um, to try and put that in, in the context of a broader periodization, when my minister talked about problems, he was essentially harking back to what the Chinese called the century of humiliation. Um, from the Opium War, First Opium War at the end of the 1830s, through the Second Opium War, through the Boxer Rebellion, through the storming of the, uh, the sack of the Summer Palace, all of this uh, had uh, damaged uh, uh, the conception of China in the world. And remember that as late as the middle of the 18th century, uh, Beijing was the largest city in the world and China was the largest economy in the world. So again, uh, if you look at it from a Chinese perspective, what's been achieved in the last 20 years in Chinese terms reverts to the norm, that China is now re-emerging and re-possessing its traditional position. But, uh, from the early part of the 20th century, I would characterize this period uh, as the period of interrupted modernity. The Chinese Revolution of 1911, Fourth of May movement, 1919, which introduced the terms Mr. Science and Mr. Democracy. This flowering of Chinese society uh, became um, destroyed first uh, by imperialist intervention and, and most specifically, um, most brutally in the case of a Japanese invasion, but also um, in the period after uh, uh, 1949 under Maoism, which emphasized the countryside over the cities. Mao particularly hated uh, the cities and especially uh, Shanghai. And it gave, and perhaps somebody who haven't got time to elaborate on this point, it gave me the impression, one of the first impressions I ever had that China was both pre-modern in the sense that it had uh, no uh, developed civil society. And it was also post-modern in the sense that it had uh, no, um, founding principles uh, of, uh, uh, of what you might call enlightenment uh, uh, um, relations between the state, uh, the citizen uh, and the market. And for me, that's still a very difficult um, question to unravel um, in, a, in an environment in which the state is much more powerful uh, in relationship to the individual and there are fewer mediating institutions which uh, enable the citizen to play a, a role in society outside the orbit of the state. Things changed in the 70s and late 1978 with uh, Deng's opening up, um, characterized in the, his famous phrase that it doesn't matter whether a cat is black or white, as long as it catches the mice, which is what his way of explaining is that what's ever best for Chinese development uh, is the best way to do it. It was a period of watchful pragmatism, which under the impact of the global financial crisis uh, became a much more assertive real politique. Or 
a way that I could uh, uh, actually pose that is that China discovered, or the Chinese political leadership discovered, that it needed to be and could be more assertive, but in a world which was much more uncertain. The certainties of the post-war order, if not collapsed, were dissolving, and China had to negotiate its position, a better position, but in, a, in, a, in an environment which didn't give any fixed points of reference. And this is most uh, best understood, I think, in terms of the need for China to integrate itself or realign the global institutions such as the World Bank, the IMF, um, the General Agreement on Tariff and Trade, the United Nations, etc., which fundamentally had been established uh, to express American hegemony after the Second World War. And this, this global realignment is the characteristic feature uh, of the period since uh, the global financial crisis uh, of 2007, 2008 onwards. So I'll try and put those general points now in the context of um, China, the USA, uh, and the problem of global hegemony. Um, I'm unsure about this, to be honest with you. Uh, I think it's a good way of explaining the dynamic, but there are a number of potential problems with it. Uh, the first is associated with uh, what's called the, the Thucydides trap. Uh, the idea that there will be a competition between a status quo power, in this case, the United States, and an emerging power, uh, in this case, uh, China. There are several problems with this. Um, uh, first ultimate problem is arguing from historical analogy um, is always problematic. Uh, the second problem which derives from that is that to understand the world um, two and a half thousand years ago, uh, in the same way as the emergence of imperialist powers uh, in the middle to the end of the 19th century is to be uh, to collapse very different societies. And so the only example that we have of a transfer of power from one power to another, from America to Britain, uh, is not necessarily the best way of approaching the, the, the competition uh, between the United States and China. Also, a, a rather more minor point, but it's worth making, is that people often assume in this that um, America is Athens and um, uh, China is Sparta. But in fact, um, very cursory reading of Thucydides makes the point that it's Sparta, which was the established power and therefore and won. And Athens, um, as a, the uh, emerging power, um, culturally more significant, historically, uh, but lost. So it's very difficult to use that analogy too far. It's also worth making the point that the battle between the United States and Britain was actually a three-way struggle for hegemony resolved around the German question. Uh, and this was prefigured in uh, British foreign policy from the end of the 19th century, recognizing both Germany and the United States as potential rivals. Uh, and it's interesting, but therefore not a parallel with contemporary discussion, is that uh, America became the dominant power over Britain through the defeat of Germany. Um, or to put it another way, uh, General Motors uh, outproduced Krupp. Um, Germany being the main rival, um, not at all Japan. The second thing I think to bear in mind on this is a broader historical point, which I think we all have to come to terms with um, from now on, is that what's normal? Um, I am a child of the post-war boom. Some of you are, some of you probably um, have gone to maturity or even just early adulthood in a period of relative capitalist decline. But the point I wanna make is, is that the period from 1950 uh, through to the end of the 70s and the 1980s is, is not the norm in capitalist social relationships, it is abnormal. And that the period in which that transformation between America and Britain happened uh, from the 1890s onwards was a period of massive instability in international relations. And we are much more likely to assume that that is uh, the norm from the late 1890s to the early 1950s. Or to put it in year terms, 
It's only six years from the end of the French occupation of the Ruhr in 1925 to the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931. And this is um, underpinned and paralleled by a crisis in the global economy, uh, a global crisis of profitability, which is not resolved until, uh, at least temporarily, until the early 1950s, again, under American economic hegemony. And one which is, uh, in terms of the dynamism of advanced capitalist societies, uh, has come to a grinding halt um, in terms of, at least in terms of economic growth rates. Of course, not in China, uh, but uh, Chinese growth rates have been very large in relationship to a relatively low base and are slowing down considerably, although anybody in the West would be very grateful for them. Okay, so then and now, I am going to pursue the ridiculous notion of comparing then and now. The American political commentator John Mearsheimer uh, makes the following point. Um, and I think it's very, um, a very accurate one and very um, honest. Why should we expect China to act any differently than the United States did? Are they more principled than we are? More ethical? Less nationalistic? Less concerned about their survival? They are none of these things, of course, which is why China is likely to initiate uh, the United States, to imitate the United States, I beg your pardon, and attempt to become a regional hegemon. And similarly, John Joseph Nye uh, in the Wall Street Journal uh, a few years ago, Beijing is laying the foundations for a new regional order with China as the natural leader and the United States as the outsider. The historical parallel to this, uh, although it's much more succinct than anything that's happened thus far, is the Washington Conference of 1921-1922. Um, the place is significant. It was held in Washington. Uh, similarly, the Berlin Congress of 1870, when Germany emerged uh, on the world stage. And at the Washington Conference, uh, the Americans um, obliged the United Kingdom, Britain, to end its alliance with Japan uh, because it was regarded by the Americans as a threat to their control of the Pacific, and also that it uh, argued for naval parity with Britain in the Pacific. Uh, and of course, this meant that as a regional power, America was able to establish itself before it became a global power, which was not the case until after the Second World War. Nothing as specific as that has happened in relationship to China's emergence, but China's use of its Asia Infrastructure Development Bank is effectively creating a economic sphere of influence in Southeast Asia, which would be comparable to or follow along America's uh, position in uh, Latin America in the period uh, after uh, the First World War. We should also consider the Belt and Road Initiative and the, uh, the discussion and the, and the effectively the propaganda around the development of the Silk Roads as China's attempt to become a regional superpower uh, prior or, you know, um, as a precondition for any further advance. A very small, perhaps practical example of this um, is that two or three years ago, um, I saw a report in a, in a Chinese newspaper um, which made the point that more people in Thailand were learning Mandarin now uh, than English. Um, clearly, both the result of jobs availability with Chinese investment and also Chinese tourism. Um, just to indicate this, is, it's, it's anecdotal uh, rather than uh, uh, academic. I remember years before the establishment of the euro and the eurozone being on a train in northern italy and um, the uh, restaurant uh, accepting deutschmarks uh, rather than lira um, one suspects that this is also the case so many places in southeast asia now where uh, renminbi would be a valuable currency to hold which leads us uh, to the question of currency and this is a very interesting broad question especially in relationship to Chinese uh, policy. Again, in the 1920s, there was a huge battle uh, between 
the, the dollar and the pound sterling as reserve currencies, um, also operating in relationship to the gold standard, one which appeared to be very easy a victory for the dollar, but the impact of the Great Depression, which disproportionately uh, impacted on America compared with Britain, it wasn't good in Britain, of course, but uh, compared with the impact in America, Britain precisely, or probably uh, because of its ability to make its empire trade with it, was able to maintain a sterling zone uh, and uh, uh, sterling as a reserve currency for much longer than it might have done if uh, things had been a little bit more rosy. This raises the question, of course, of how China can emerge and compete at the level of international transactions uh, with the United States, because this is impossible until the RMMB, the Yuan, is fully convertible. And in a sense, uh, this is an economic no-brainer, uh, but politically it's very difficult. It's difficult for China or the, for Beijing to uh, organize or recognize uh, having an open currency, which then becomes available for international speculations. So what we see is in the immediate aftermath of the global financial crisis, and certainly in relationship to the Eurozone crisis, is that there is an acceleration of the moves towards full convertibility. Um, the establishment of free trade zones in, in China, um, and this again uh, is very important in relationship to China's Beijing's relationship to Hong Kong uh, as a conduit uh, for some form of uh, convertibility and uh, got the city of London in hysterics uh, being desperate to become the first uh, center for international exchange uh, as opposed to, to Frankfurt. Um, and then a hesitancy uh, about this um, because of those uh, political constraints. So um, these figures are slightly out of date, but the RMB still remains weak uh, as an international uh, reserve currency. The IMF uh, reports that foreign reserves held by central banks and governments, 62% of those are held in dollars, 21% are held in euros, uh, the yen five, sterling four, and the renminbi comes in uh, at a very paltry uh, 2%. Um, a related question is that China has huge amounts of foreign exchange reserves, um, plus or minus uh, 3.51 trillion US dollars, and 67% of those are held in US dollars, 20% in euros, and most of the rest in yen and sterling. So what this effectively means is that um, the Chinese and the American economies are incredibly interlinked, uh, and China has a great commitment to the dollar um, and up to a point and paradoxically its maintenance, um, not only as a reserve currency, uh, but as something uh, worth holding on to. Um, the move towards the Euros was prior to the Eurozone crisis and the Eurozone crisis meant for a re think inside uh, Chinese um, uh, international financial strategy uh, and led to that acceleration of the move towards China as a reserve currency. But this is, has become much more tentative uh, in the last uh, three or four years. If I look now at the question of um, spheres of influence, in the 1920s, again, using the historical parallel, uh, we've already noted the Pacific um, for the first time, uh, America uh, fully established its uh, domination in Latin America. Uh, you might uh, remember the Monroe Doctrine, which said that no foreign interference should be allowed in the, in the Americas. But of course, this was a, a non-starter in the 19th century uh, with British influence uh, uh, throughout uh, the region. But in the early 20s, America consolidated its hold, uh, let's say specifically in relationship with Venezuelan oil, but was unable to do this in the Middle East um, Britain uh, maintained its uh, its position in the Middle East after the First World War, and particularly in relationship to British Petroleum and Middle Eastern oil. And this was finally ended only with the debacle of Suez in 1956. So America at that point ceased to be a collection of regional powers, and at least uh, for a few years, 
became the global power, the global policeman. If we look at the Chinese experience, um, the, I think an important thing to remember is that from a Chinese perspective, China thinks of itself as encircled. It is surrounded not by friends, but by potential enemies under the direction of the United States. Um, so um, it's very well worth considering this, which is you know, very, um, very rarely mentioned in any uh, mainstream commentate, commentary on this. And it regards the world very much in terms of four rings. The first ring is greater China, which essentially means anything which has been or ever was uh, Chinese, thus including Xinjiang, Tibet, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. The second is the 14 adjacent countries, the areas around it, um, with which it's worth saying it has had five wars uh, in the 20th century, uh, Russia, uh, Japan, uh, India, uh, South Korea, and Vietnam. So China does not consider itself to be um, in charge or um, in control of a friendly area. The third is six distinct geopolitical re regions uh, throughout China. And perhaps more importantly, the fourth is the world beyond. And this again relates to the Belt and Road Initiative. What that is, is ability to sell its commodities and control markets, uh, to develop investments, uh, secure alliances, and to isolate support, uh, particularly uh, for Taiwan and Tibet. When we look at the Belt and Road Initiative, at one level, the way it's presented is of re-establishment of the historic Silk Roads. Um, more particularly, it is to establish control of the South and the East China Seas, even pushing forward to the Indian Ocean uh, and uh, into Central Asia. Um, particular example of that, um, I spent a couple of uh, visits in Kazakhstan, um, in the short term, many Kazakhs are worried about Russian influence in the north. Um, it's one of the reasons they moved the capital from Almaty to Astana. Uh, but in the medium term, they're much more concerned about China, even though the, their government uh, attempted to sell uh, agricultural land to the Chinese, and at least temporarily, it was blocked uh, by popular opposition. Uh, not something that you'd expect in Kazakhstan, but uh, it certainly happened uh, for a short period of time. The Beer Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, is, is often assumed to be an incredibly coordinated um, deployment. Um, it's far from that. Uh, on one sense, it's an attempt to um, deal with um, surplus of inefficient state enterprises, uh, and it's also exploratory uh, and also speculative. If you were to be um, not cynical about it, if you attempted to understand it in the way that uh, Chinese understand their own civilization, and I, I hesitate again to say this because the idea that there is something qualitatively different about the Chinese approach to anything is, is something that should really be interrogated. Um, so I'll warn you that I'm now using an analogy uh, developed by Henry Kissinger. Um, not the nicest of person, but sometimes an acute observer. And he compares Chinese diplomacy, which I would include the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, as equivalent to Wai Chi or Go, uh, a Chinese game, which unlike chess, doesn't demand a decisive victory, but is a game of surrounding pieces, of potentially interlocking areas of strength. Or alternatively, you try something here, it might work. You try something there, it won't work and you pull back. And so it's a, a period of exploration in terms of, of China uh, moving forward uh, in order to broaden its influence uh, at an economic and then a political level. I now wanna look at um, two much more, perhaps you could say specific areas in which some of China's weaknesses are also exposed. And these are demography and productivity. A significant problem in China is its aging population. Um, this will continue after the, uh, the end of the one child policy, 
certainly in the urban centers, um, the reproduction rate in Shanghai has not gone up uh, after the end of the one child policy. Uh, many reasons for this, uh, not least uh, the expensive nature of Chinese education and the difficulty of coping with more than one child. Specifically, about a third, 35% of China's population will be over 60 by 2050, up from the current level of 17%. Now, of course, factor into this a healthy old age. Um, you know, we can all be productive um, in our dotage or before our dotage. This is faster than any other country in modern history. And Chinese working age population will fall by 23% by 2050. Now, this is an incredibly, um, the demographers say the demographic sweet spot has long gone. In, in opposition or in contrast to this, the median age in the United States of the US population is expected to go from age 38 today uh, only to 43 by 2060. Over 65s are 16% now and will still only be 23% by 2060. One of the great merits of American immigration and bring me your huddle masses, um, the US population made up by immigrants in 2017 was 13.6%, 44 million. In 1960, it was 5.4%, 9.7 million. Legal immigrants around 1.1 million a year. So, in the um, incidentally, of course, these are predominantly from Mexico, China, and India, which um, certainly in the case of India and China, and I'm sure in the case of Mexico as well, uh, is a lot of dynamic startups. Uh, increasing percentage of new startups in the United States are from uh, migrant communities. And the opposite of that, of course, in China is the individual and state burden uh, of an aging population. In terms of productivity, as Paul Krugman says in the age of diminishing expectations, productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it is almost everything. Or much more succinctly um, and more poetically, uh, Karl Marx described it through the economy of human labor time, the ability to produce more, better, in less time and less inputs. My direct experience uh, of, of this productivity gap is the, the, China, uh, the fact that China can throw resources at many things, but those resources are quantitative rather than qualitative. Although that has to be said that there are many indications that this is changing, but whether it's changing enough and far enough is another matter. To illustrate that, some figures um, from uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, slightly out of date now, I think these are two years old, the relationship between innovation and income levels. Um, in the USA, out of 138 economies, the USA ranks fourth and China 30th. Um, the ability to embrace technology and use it um, across the board in the economy. The USA ranks 14th, again out of 138, and China 74th. On the competitiveness of the, competitiveness of the economy overall, the USA is third and China 28th. And finally, on job training, um, which in this index um, is subsumed to help match workers and vacancies, the USA ranks eighth and China ranks 54th. China still lags in terms of FDI flowing into the country. And this, of course, is, this is exacerbated in the last few years with the increase of tensions. Um, although, of course, some countries, uh, for example, Germany, uh, are less inhibited by this. It's high tech exports are less than 25% of those of the US. And on the other hand, it is the biggest investor in renewable energy globally, spending more than the US and Europe combined, and now leads in areas such as free fabricated construction techniques. Uh, when the Oakland Bridge uh, had to be rebuilt some years ago, uh, it had to be, it was built in Shanghai and transported across the Pacific. Um, we're now familiar with telecommunications technologies such as Huawei, which of course the um, United States is desperately now trying to claw back the, the Chinese advantage in this, uh, as well as nanotechnology applications and new energy sources. Everywhere you go in China, every significant city has a huge science park. What they do is another matter. And right, research and development spending is considerably higher in China um, 
and so in South Korea, of course, than any country in uh, in Europe or the United States. And this this brings me to a question which I don't know the answer to. Um, I think it's a it's a very difficult question to even approach. And this is the relationship between the state enterprises uh, and what you might call an entrepreneurial spirit or innovation and creativity, because by far the highest proportion of uh, research and development goes into the state enterprises, which are still, um, despite some reforms uh, 10, 15 years ago, are still far too inefficient uh, and um, also political fiefdoms. Um, they are places in which um, you find a, a way inside the party hierarchy uh, of uh, making a lot of money and control, uh, controlling assets and resources. And at the same time, even though there are knowledge clusters, the Yangpu district, for example, in uh, Shanghai, which is supposed to draw on the expertise of uh, Hongzhi University in Fudan and offers cheap uh, spaces for startup companies, there is still an endemic problem of hierarchy uh, and inefficiency in major companies. And this also travels over into debates and discussions about education itself. Uh, whether the, can, the consensual nature or the necessary consensual nature of thought inhibits any form of uh, entrepreneurial or innovative uh, business practice. So there's a long way to go uh, for China to uh, catch up in, in many of these areas. Uh, it doesn't have in quite the same form the uh, credit fueled consumption issues uh, of the United States, but it has, again, uh, far too much unskilled labor uh, and the necessity uh, for increasing consumer spending uh, in China in order to overcome uh, the decline in, in foreign markets. I think I've got two major points to go and at the maximum I've got 11 minutes, so uh, bear with me, I will try very hard. I want to look here at the question of soft power. There's um, apocryphal graffiti uh, from a few years ago in Afghanistan, which says, Yankee, go home and take me with you. Now, of course, that now has much more uh, tragic implications uh, than it did when uh, it was first posed, which the point being is nobody likes American intervention, but everybody wants to go to America. And whether this will still be the case, whether you, you still do that, and whether it still be the attractive option is the key question of the idea of the attractiveness of the United States, the quality of a country's political institutions, the extent of its cultural appeal, the strength of their diplomatic networks, the global reputation of their higher education system, the attractiveness of their economic model, and the country's digital engagement with the world. All of this um, are a summary of what um, the American commentator Joseph Nye attempted to summarize as soft power. And in contrast to that, we have the idea of how attractive will there be in Beijing? For example, is, if it's true, the uh, Chinese influence on the World Health Organization or China's response to COVID inhibit or enhance the soft power of China? Or to look specifically at the idea of the Beijing consensus, a term coined by um, Joshua Kuparama to frame China's economic development model as an alternative, especially for developing countries to the Washington consensus which is the IMFM, World Bank and the US Treasury. He explained that the Beijing consensus shows that not every nation will follow China's development model, but that it legitimizes the notion of particularity as opposed to the universality of a Western model. And this applies both to investment models in Africa, uh, which are very different from those uh, of the West, to uh, attractiveness to uh, authoritarian regimes, again, perhaps in Africa, who want to follow a different model, 
or want to be justified in terms of a different model, right through to such things as the regulatory bodies in the international sphere and the most open debate or the most open conflict at the moment, for example, is about control over the internet and which regulatory model uh, will be uh, accepted in, in many different places in the world. So whereas Hu Jintao uh, made the point that Chinese culture belongs to the whole world, more recently, Xi Jinping said that we must build our country into a socialist cultural superpower, uh, a very different uh, emphasis. Point on confidence and cohesion. Um, I won't say very much about the United States. If people want to talk about this, we, we can talk about it, uh, about the culture wars and the increasing incoherence, you might call it, of uh, US society in the sense what it is to be American and what America stands for. Looking more directly at China, we've come a long way from not being confident at all about China's future and position in the world, which I experienced um, 15 years ago. I remember being at a, a conference organized by uh, the Shanghai Administration Institute as not very long ago, in which one of the keynote speakers um, referring to Martin Luther King's speech, I have a dream, made the point that this was an example of American individualism, uh, whereas um, uh, President Xi Jinping had a China dream for everyone. Um, I took the opportunity to make the point that Martin Luther King's I have a dream was a speech in front of a quarter of a million people who had precisely the same dream. Xi Jinping, relating the point of soft power to that China dream, we should increase China's soft power, give a good Chinese narrative and better communicate China's message to the world. It was a, an update of President of Mao saying, the past is being constructed to serve the present. Areas in which I think this can all be seen, um, and I'm gonna to have to move much more quickly on this and just itemize them. What are the sources of legitimacy uh, for the Chinese political elite? Very important in terms of the absence of a revolutionary cadre of a common experience of a generation of activists. First of all, of course, is economic dynamism, which is supported by social amelioration. Uh, so uh, introduction of elements of a social welfare state, not least uh, to encourage consumer spending because Chinese savings rate uh, is very, very high uh, and can be reduced by a provision of forms of uh, ben benefit, including pensions. It's also inhibited by local government debt, uh, which probably can be coped with at the level of national um, um, reserves a stock market and housing bubble, which uh, threaten uh, economic stability. A reintroduction of Confucianism, uh, the devotion to the past, which start, is in marked contrast uh, to the period, certainly the Cultural Revolution and afterwards. Um, I just make this point in passing that somebody I knew in Shanghai uh, had morphed from being a professor of uh, scientific socialism to being a professor of Confucian. Uh, thought. The issue of Han nationalism and how far this is prevalent among the general population as opposed to uh, party acolytes. The ongoing significance of the absence of a civil society. There are uh, the existence of government, non-government organizations and the over politicization, the response to an over politicization of the Cultural Revolution. The real experience of large numbers of young people with decreasing social mobility, intense working pressure, 996, nine till nine, six days a week, and the sense that you can never escape this, uh, the growth of a, a youth um, uh, online platform or network called Diolsi, or Losers, and the celebration of that. The, not the control, but the monitoring of netizens uh, to direct uh, public displeasure. The huge number 
of isolated incidents of power, uh, but uh, of opposition, but with no uh, contact between them, and the element of trust. The government doesn't trust the people, the people don't trust the government, and more dangerously, how far do the people not uh, trust each other? Perhaps that's not a good point to end on, but I'm much more conscious at the moment of finishing at least three minutes within the outside limit of what I was asked to speak on. And I hope I've uh, offered some interesting points for discussion and I'm very interested to hear your views. Thank you.